And if that doesn't wake you up in the morning, I'm not sure what will. So my name is Jesse. I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and I am so excited to bring another full school year of amazing programs to all of you at home, in the classroom, teaching digitally, teaching staggered. However you guys are teaching this year, it's a crazy year, but we really appreciate all of you coming back from across Canada, the U.S., and more to join us as we highlight amazing scientists, educators, explorers, conservationists, from around the globe. Yesterday, we got started with the Toucan Rescue Ranch in Costa Rica. We have some groups joining us again from yesterday's talk, so nice to have you guys back to kick off the school year. And today, I'm really excited because we are bringing in a new speaker. From all the way across the pond in the UK, we are joined by Dr. Tom Hart. He is a penguinologist, which is exactly what it sounds like at the University of Oxford, and he gets to travel to some of the most remote and amazing locations around the entire world in pursuit of understanding one of the coolest, most endangered, uh, most fascinating and cutest birds on the entire planet in penguins. We're going to learn a lot about them and how you at home can get involved in actual citizen science to help understand and conserve them. So without further ado, I'm going to bring in Tom and uh, let us dive in with a presentation. Thanks so much for joining us today, Tom. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so yes, they, obviously there will be time for questions and answers, but I want to tell you a little bit about penguins. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, why we do this, and then I'll finish with uh, what it's like actually living in the field in places like Antarctica. Uh, so I need to start with the thank you because everyone forgets at the end. So this is my project, but it is in collaboration with a lot of people around the world. We have quark expeditions in Canada who take us to where we need to go, and we have academic partners such as Stony Brook, Louisiana State in the US, where we all divide up these data and work on them together. So you might have thought of Antarctica as something like this. Uh, it's, it's big, it's white, and it all looks the same, right? Well, well, no, it doesn't. So firstly, a lot of the Antarctic we're talking about is marine. So it's not just big mountains and big Ice, icy plains. A lot of this is very closely tied to the sea. As you do go quite far south, it tends to look like this, but bits of it, the islands around Antarctica, are also fringed with green. So it's not just uniform, it really is quite diverse, and, and I think people forget that in their, their, um, their stereotypes of what it's like. Uh, so it's, it's very different, and a lot of that depends on sea ice. So Antarctica is a continent surrounded by an ocean. And in winter, the, the top of the sea freezes, and that expands out um, quite far north. And some of these islands you can see there, some of them are, are outside of the icy zone, and some of them are, are in it. And that also depends on what kind of penguins we get. So you can see that there's this kind of seasonal pulse, freezes in winter, thaws in summer, and the timing of that thawing also influences what can be there. So we have several different species of penguins. There's probably 20 overall. We're still doing the genetics to work out how many, but there's at least 18 recognizable ones that look different. And the, the ones out in the sub-Antarctic these are slightly more vulnerable, quite a lot more numerous. So the most numerous penguin on the planet is probably the macaroni. And that's somewhere like six to eight million pairs on islands like South Georgia. Uh, things like the royal penguin, which look fairly similar. But these are all on the outskirts of Antarctica, on these sub-Antarctic islands. And, and that's partly why they're a bit more colourful, maybe. As we get closer onto the Antarctic mainland, you might recognize some of these. These are a lot more of the stereotypical penguins. Uh, so we have one group that are very closely related called the brush tails or the pygocelids. And these are things like the gentoo penguins. You can see they're going quite far down the Antarctic peninsula, but not that much on the Antarctic mainland. So a lot of these are, are still on islands like South Georgia. But the their gentoos are quite versatile, so they, these are also found quite far down the Antarctic Peninsula. 
another one you might recognize but not know is the king penguin. It looks a lot like the emperor penguin, but found in absolutely huge numbers um, on islands like South Georgia and uh, Kerguelen. <coughs> um, come a bit further south and, and we start finding things like the chinstrap penguin. So these are, as, as we go further south, these penguins have to become a lot more ice tolerant and they tend to get a bit more narrow in their diet. So they tend to be focused on one or two species of fish and krill. And absolutely everything in Antarctica eats krill to some degree, which is this little shrimp thing. Uh, then we've got a dailies. You might recognize these. These are, these are what a lot of people think a penguin looks like. And these are incredibly hardy, found all the way around Antarctica. But of course, don't forget that most species, we think of them as Antarcticans, but they actually disappear in, in winter. So when it's really cold, they're usually out at sea swimming and, and finding food. And they're really only coming ashore to breed. They're, they're absolutely famous um, uh, example, or, sorry, um, exception to that is the emperor penguin. So these are the biggest penguins. They're, they're up to about 45 kilos, uh, which is probably heavier than quite a few of you. And um, these breed on the sea ice. So they actually never touch the continent of Antarctica. They're breeding over winter on this, on this frozen sea. Really quite an impressive bird. So why do I study penguins? Well, seabirds around the world are crashing. We have a lot of threats we know of. Fishing is a huge one. Uh, pollution is a huge one in the developed world and the developing world, but less so in places like Antarctica. And of course, climate change is another huge one. So why we monitor, why we study penguins is that these seem to be indicators of what is going on in Antarctica. Now, it's not all bad news, um, but it is for those that rely on sea ice. So those that rely on sea ice or krill tend to be doing quite badly. And those that are, are not, can, uh, don't, don't need a lot of ice or can do without ice, those ones tend to be doing quite well. The king penguin was actually exploited. It used to be caught and boiled up for oil. Um, so that's partly recovering from history and historic exploitation. Um, and you'll see we've got two arrows for the Adélie penguin. Well, these are really crashing on the Antarctic Peninsula, but doing quite well in East Antarctica. So what we call East Antarctica is the bit below Australia. These, these trends are actually pretty dramatic and pretty fast. Uh, this is a place called Bailey Head. Um, in around 2000, just before the year 2000, it had over 100,000 breeding pairs of chinstrap penguins. We've just finished recounting this from an aerial survey and we're down to 39,000. So it's more than halved in 20 years. And that's really fast. I mean, if half of your classmates died out over a couple of years, you would, you would be pretty worried. You'd probably stop going to school. Um, so there's, there's clearly still a lot of penguins, but there's a lot in some areas and they're declining in others. So this, these trends are quite concerning. And also some of the, the, the places we need to be looking are very hard to reach. So this is an island called Zavodovsky. It's in the South Sandwich Islands. Very few people have ever been there. And until we started going there, really no one was counting them. It was very hard to count colonies like these. And now we start to do it from drones. It becomes a lot more manageable. So those are the, the threats we have. And when we look at Antarctica, it's really climate change, potentially overfishing um, and also potentially direct disturbance from human, humans there. Um, the climate change is really quite a concerning one. It's not necessarily just temperature, it's that we're losing sea ice. 
So the Antarctic Peninsula has lost sea ice coverage for nearly three months of the year since the 1960s. So you look at in the red, you see temperature is increasing since the 1950s and the amount of sea ice has decreased. That's not true everywhere. Again, there's this east-west divide. The peninsula is doing is changing pretty rapidly. East Antarctica, um, far less so. But we see this when we're out in the field, we see some pretty big changes. So we don't have maps and charts for a lot of the places we go. We actually navigate on satellite images in some cases. And here you can see we have a boat one and a half miles inland of where the, the head of the glacier was a couple of years before. And we do see this in real time. So this is these are Ted Cheeseman's photos, but this is glacier retreat at one of my favorite sites in South Georgia. And you really see the change in the Heaney Glacier. And that's over my lifetime. That's less than, sorry, that's uh, less than, than uh, 10 years. We've seen a good half a mile retreat. But, and this is really important, whenever people talk about a lot of these threats like climate change, like fishing, um, they're not uniform. It really depends on where you look. And that also, so measuring things in many different locations can help us to work out what is going on and what we can do about it. So this is the, the loss of sea ice. And you can see that there are more red areas in the Antarctic Peninsula, but bits of East Antarctica are actually stable or cooling. So it really depends on where we look. And that, that is important for how we manage penguins. One of the big worries I have is fishing. Now, um, fishing has recently increased, not just in the amount, but also where they're going. They're getting very efficient at taking krill. And that's a problem for everything from whales and seals to penguins. So fisheries, they don't have to set and haul their nets anymore. They just siphon up um, krill from where they are and they go in small circles. So making real dead patches of ocean near penguin colonies. Um, if you or your parents ever take krill oil, I would encourage you not to. There is no proven benefit to this and it is unnecessary. It harms penguins. And one of our worries is that um, when we look at the amount of fishing that is going on in Antarctica, it's slightly increased since the 1980s, um, but it has moved further south and come next to penguin colonies a lot more than it was in the early days of that fishery. So what do we do? What do we do with, uh, with Penguin Watch? Well, Penguin Watch is trying to gather enough data that we can prove what these impacts are. Um, we hitchhike on cruise ships and things like that. And I don't know if you can see this, but in the bottom of the screen, there's a tiny camera on a rock. And that is the star of this show. So what we do is we hitch lifts on anyone that can get us all around Antarctica. And we collect as much data as we can when we're there. We fly drones to count penguins. We leave these cameras behind that, that record every hour what penguins are doing in a, in a colony. And it will do that for a whole year. Uh, we get very good at hitching lifts. So a lot of Antarctica is visited. It's just visited very rarely. So we plan an awful lot. And this is hitching uh, a lift, sorry, the previous slide was hitching a lift with Quark Expeditions in Canada. And this is Antarctic Logistics and Exploration, um, also half Canadian, half US. Uh, and these are twin otters that are beautiful aircraft that take us onto the ice. You can see they replace their, their wheels uh, with skis and it's quite exciting um, landing on, on glaciers. Uh, and this is another one with Quark Expeditions. This is um, taking an icebreaker and then uh, coming the last bit with a helicopter to, to go and study an emperor penguin colony um, in the Weddell Sea. 
So we hitchhike as much as we can. And then what we do is we try and fundraise and we get a load of scientists together and we charter a yacht. So we, we hire a yacht to go to the places that we really want to find out stuff and that no one has gone to. So places like the South Sandwich Islands I mentioned. And we leave these things in place. These are a US camera called Reconnix. Um, forget the camouflage, it looks slightly ridiculous in Antarctica, but these are, these are hunting cameras. And we leave these overlooking penguin colonies where they take a photo usually every hour, but sometimes more often. You can go to Penguin Watch and you can help us save penguins. So what we do on Penguin Watch, this is a citizen science program. We get you to click on adults, chicks and eggs. And that helps extract the data for it. Um, from these millions of images we collect every year. Um, how do we trust people that aren't scientists? Well, we, we take several different people's annotations and we cluster them together. So we take an average of each of these and you see that comes out pretty well on the penguins we're interested in. Um, we then train these to... Um, the sites that people have looked at a lot, we can train a computer how to recognize penguins in those sites. So we're gradually automating a lot of these. And you can see here there's, on average, if you look on the right-hand side, you can see the number of penguins in each nest. And you can see that there's always at least one there. So they're always guarding that egg or that chick and then occasionally there's two, which is when they, they change over. And occasionally a nest fails. So when it goes down to zero, that might be a predator like a, a, a skewer, um, which is a predatory bird. Maybe that came along, or maybe the, the parent wasn't vigilant enough and the egg got too cold. Um, what are we finding? Well, we're finding variable success around Antarctica. One of the things you may have seen in the news is that every now and then, and this is a partly a climate change story and partly natural, we're seeing a few more um, snow and rain showers on Antarctica than, than we have done previously. And we're showing with these really detailed camera shots that um, when there's extreme events, these storms do kill off quite a few eggs. So, so uh, that enables us to show what's going on and also where. So of course we can, here we're, we're looking at a storm, but equally we can compare areas that are fished with areas that aren't fished. And we hope to prove what is the impact of fishing and then do something about it. Um, this does help, this helps with um, marine protected areas. That's a lot of what we do is trying to advise and give real evidence, uh, so not just opinion, we want scientific evidence to say what is important and where is it important, so that policymakers and politicians, we hope, will do something about it. Uh, so that's something we helped designate um, uh, on behalf of South Georgia government. Um, this is up on South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands, and it's a really good example of where conservation can make a difference. That's almost completely protected now, and South Georgia is recovering quite well. The question is now, what do we do on the Antarctic Peninsula? And we're trying to create marine protected areas, smaller ones, so that we can prove what the impact of, of protection is on penguin colonies, and then hopefully build it from there. So that's that's the what we do, that's why we do it. And I know that a lot of people want to know what is life like in Antarctica. So I've put a little bit together on what life is like in the field. Yep. Oh, that was great. I was just, it, it looks fantastic. Um, tell us. Sorry, Jesse, I thought you were, I thought you had a point. Um, so yes, uh, this is me in a hut. This is in St. Andrews Bay on South Georgia. You can see that glacier in the background. So we are very varied. 
like I say, we we spend a lot of time hitching on ships, sometimes camping, sometimes on yachts, and there's a lot of problem solving. Antarctica is quite a hard place. So this is working out. We're actually trying to swim ashore onto a onto an island in the South Sandwich Islands uh, where there's a bit of a surf break. Now, you may have heard of Captain Scott and some of the early explorers. Now, this is them after um, an expedition went badly wrong and they were exposed. They lost their tent for several uh, well, for several nights in the middle of the Antarctic winter. And you can see these guys don't look very happy. Um, and so there's a lot of planning. This is more what I want to be like. So this is someone you will never have heard of. It's uh, Jean-Baptiste Charcot. And he was a French explorer who explored a lot of the Antarctic Peninsula. He did an incredible job. He collected a lot of scientific data um, explored a lot of area, but he didn't kill anyone, so you probably haven't heard of him. So this is very much what we're trying to do. We want to be, um, uh, we want to live well, and we want to collect data and come back alive. So modern work in Antarctica is a lot of um, working out lists and timings. Um, to have enough food, not only for the amount of time you want to camp somewhere, for example, but what if the next ship or the one after that doesn't turn up? So do you have enough to survive for potentially up to a month longer than you hope to? Uh, one example of that is we spent a year planning, well, a, a two years planning, one year training for an expedition to Snow Hill that that involved skiing in the last bit. And um, with several weeks before we were due to leave, um, we got the first sea ice images of the year and the sea ice was absolutely atrocious. So we, we canceled that after two years planning. Um, but when things go well, uh, you have an absolutely incredible exciting and quite scary moment when you get dropped off by a plane or a ship and it leaves you and you're on the on your own in the middle of of nowhere with um enough food enough kit and a job to do so really quite exciting and nerve-wracking um i hope this will play yeah so you can see how deep these tents are dug in. And this is Fiona, a PhD student, um, going to our, our cook station in between the two tents. And you can see how deep we've dug that so that um, we're out of the wind. So a lot of what life is like in the field is just trying to make sure you're safe, secure. And there's a lot more time um, cooking, cleaning, and making water. And um, and in fact, you, you go absolutely crazy over food. Food and getting enough sleep is, is really, really important. But there's no doubt it's an incredible privilege to live in a place like this. I mean, it, it really is, it's, it's hard, but so rewarding and incredibly beautiful. Um, hard in terms of things like doing the washing up. And you have to take turns so that you don't have any kind of resentment or annoyance build up, thinking that one person is doing more than the others. Uh, so it's the human, um, the human contact in this is absolutely vital. It's um, you come out with some of the closest friends from working in Antarctica, but equally, if things go wrong, it can go wrong incredibly badly. So this is something you might want to look up if you haven't heard of it. Uh, it's a very good example. Uh, this was um, one Russian researcher who stabbed another one after a winter where this guy had, um, had revealed the endings of any book he saw the other guy reading. So after a winter of this, 
um, this guy went absolutely bonkers and, and stabbed it. Now, that is a breakdown in communication. And that's exactly the kind of thing that, that we try and avoid. Um, but when you, when you can do that, when you can live together harmoniously in Antarctica, it's, it really is one of the most enriching experiences you can possibly have um, with some incredibly close friends for life. Uh, so that's it. Um, I'll just leave this on a, on a slideshow. And are there any questions? Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much, Tom, for such a fun talk. I Listen, the, the juxtaposition of the English explorers and then the French guys was one of the greatest duos of slides in the history of exploring by the seat of your pants, so I appreciate that immensely. Um, and we're going to dive in with questions. We've been getting a whole bunch. Uh, we've got classes in North Carolina, Miami, Ontario, and more on YouTube and Facebook, so welcome into them. I'm going to start us off with Miss Foster's class in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And if you get a chance, Tom, check out the drawings they made ahead of time of you and Penguin watch it's really fantastic stuff uh, but if i'll bring you, them into the uh, anyone if you um if you copy us into if you um on twitter if you include at penguin watch of course we'll see them and of course we'll retweet them fantastic so yes miss foster didn't go for it um, over time have penguins moved to different locations due to climate change or has it have they generally stayed in the same place so yes have they have they moved or have they stayed in the same place um a bit of both we can certainly see some species that have moved. The Gentoo penguin, that's one of the, the winners from climate change, those have moved a bit further south. I mean, it's, it's not massive, to be honest. Um, they've only moved about, it's probably about 30 or 40 miles in 100 years. Uh, so that's not big. Um, but yes, there has been some movement. And the flip side to that is, you see things like chin straps and adelies retreating. So they're dying out where gentes are taking over. Um, but in general, the response has been uh, changes in breeding and changes in the population size at certain locations. Great first question, guys. Uh, yeah. all right. Let's go to Miss Elliot's class in Dallas, Texas. Welcome back in, guys. And uh, nice to have you as we again start the school year. Thank you. Uh, while studying penguins, have you ever seen or been attacked by a polar bear? Um, so, no, I've never been uh, not while studying penguins because um, polar bears live in the Arctic and penguins in the Antarctic and there's no, there's no overlap. Uh, so I do a bit of seabird, uh, seabird work in the, in the Arctic and we do see polar bears up there, but we never see penguins and polar bears at the same time. I'm really glad we got that question. I assumed you would every time we talk about penguins or polar bears, we get that juxtaposition. So what we'll try and do is by the end of the broadcast, send to all the classes and a link, just a distribution list of where you can find penguins. I know you, you covered this in the beginning of your talk, but just to highlight where those species are so you can get a sense of that on the map. All right, let's go to Ms. Olsen's group in Rochester in Minnesota. Hi guys, if you have a question on behalf of your class, just demute your mic and uh, you'll be good to go. You will need to demute your own. There you go. Okay, so we were wondering yeah. if you have any penguin pets. Penguin pets? No, I'm afraid not. Um, <laughs> for a start, I'm pretty sure that's illegal. Um, and uh, I like them in the wild. Uh, the It's very hard to recognize them, so there's none that we really recognize as, as an individual. Um, but despite that, they are fascinating to watch. So it, it is a bit weird in that you're you're watching a, a crowd, um, but, yeah, it's very hard to recognize an individual between visits or even in the same day, but they are absolutely fascinating to watch. And personally, I think they're much better in the wild. Yeah, fantastic. That's actually something that we got brought up in our Toucan Rescue Ranch talk the other day, the importance of leaving wild animals in the wild and not interacting with them either. If you see instances where people can have a monkey on your head or a toucan or a sloth, try and avoid those interactions, there are better ways to help with conservation. So Yeah, and I think it's, it's important to recognize that zoos have a place for conserving animals that are doing badly in the wild. Um, yeah. but, um, penguins aren't going to go extinct in the wild. It would be far better to conserve them there. And it's it's actually the really 
the boring species, if you like. It's the mountain frogs and things like that that, that really would do well when zoos focus captive breeding efforts on those. Yeah. We've actually done several programs with the Virginia Zoo and the Toronto Zoo highlighting some of their conservation efforts. So anyone who's tuning in can check those out on our YouTube channel as right. well. Um, but what we'll do right now is go to the Glass family in Iowa City, Iowa. Welcome in, guys. If you have a question for us, just deem your mic and uh, you'll be good to come up. Hey, guys. If the video is working, wants to work. There we go. <laughs> and I'll let you know when you're all set. Perfect. Go okay. for it. We were wondering if you notice or if you observe any difference in penguin behavior when you're observing them there in person compared to when you're observing them through data from cameras. Um, do we? So, uh, sorry, you cut out there a minute. But oh, yeah. do you do you notice any difference in person versus via the cameras? Well, great question. So we're we're only seeing the the cameras take a photo every hour. Some take a photo every minute when we're trying to look at um, at uh, feeding rates, but uh, so largely not because we're very careful uh, not to disturb them when we're there. But you do see examples of disturbance for sure, yeah. and there are there are colonies that are visited often that are kind of unflappable, if you like. Hmm. And if you go to a colony that has never seen a human, then you need to be a lot more careful because we normally reckon that they're comfy until you're within about five meters of them if you're quiet. And if uh, if it's a colony that's never seen a human, then you could be 10 or 20 meters away and they're all really paying attention and, and agitated. So so definitely, the yeah, from a distance, you, you could disturb them quite a lot. So we're, that is something that, that we, that tourists, have to be incredibly careful about. That's a really interesting note. Just a quick follow-up on that, because are there natural predators of theirs that they would sort of assume that a person might fit the bill of, or? No, but, um, no, but uh, you know, if you're near an elephant, um, it's not a natural predator of you, but if it charged up and looked, um, big, loud, and scary, you would be scared. And um, so the issue is not, the issue is that we disturb them on the nest and a predator that does take their eggs or something like that could get in and, and steal an egg. Yeah. So that's one of the worries, but but just in general around wildlife, um, it's, you know, there's it's always better to be quiet and to be slow moving and sort of not to focus on them too much or or um yeah a, a lot of animals can get very easily scared yeah. um, when they don't know our intentions yeah. great message them clubby we got to that um a quick question from youtube is it's a, a softball one for you genevieve in oshawa she's joined us on a ton of our broadcast she wants to know is there a species of penguin that is most at risk one that we should really be concerned about yeah um two really and these are not in antarctica uh, there's one in Galapagos, the Galapagos penguin, and in South Africa, the black-footed penguin. Um, th these are the ones that have declined the most over the 20th century. Um, in Antarctica, the fastest changing is chin straps. Those are the ones I'm most worried about at the moment because they completely overlap with the, where fishing is going on. Um, but yes, in Big picture, what is the biggest concern? It's outside Antarctica. It's in, um, yeah, probably the main concern would be the black-footed one in, in South Africa. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Tom. Um, all right, one more quick YouTube question, then we'll go to Ms. Michael's group uh, joining us live. So in Miami, Ms. Places class, they wanted to know about climate change and plastics and how those affect penguins. Now, you covered climate change quite a bit. Yeah. Are marine plastics something that penguins need to be worried about, that we should be concerned about in Antarctica? Not, not in Antarctica. Uh, there's very little plastic residue in Antarctica. Um, we are increasingly finding it, um, but it doesn't seem to be a massive problem yet. Um, because of the way the currents work, Antarctica is quite well protected from pollution. So any pollution in Antarctica will stay in Antarctica, but plastics moving around the world's oceans actually tend not 
to get blown south. There's a lot of wind coming that's blowing things north. Huh. And there's a current that completely circulates around Antarctica. So uh, it's a problem. It's hard to know how big a problem it is yet, but it's certainly not a massive one or we would have seen big impacts already. So, yeah, I would that say... That is fascinating. We've never actually covered that. So, so yeah, globally, plastics are a huge problem for um, birds, fish, turtles, sea, you know, sea mammals, eating them, um, them looking like salps and things like that in the water and, and squid. So there's no doubt plastics is one of the biggest problems worldwide, but, yeah, just not in Antarctica. Yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm heartened to hear that. If, if classes are interested in plastics, it's one of our big topics this month. We have a whole story map for it that we just put out in our newsletter. Uh, but good to hear that of the threats facing penguins, plastics well, are, low on, are low on the list, are low on the list. Not a, not I think we can relax because there's one place on Earth that we haven't trashed yet. Um, but, um, um, but the flip side in the Arctic, there is a lot of plastic debris. And and again, that's that's the flip side in that there isn't this current that protects the Arctic. Right. Um, well, we really appreciate the, the overview. That's fantastic. Let's go to Ms. Michael's group, and then we'll do another round of questions if we have time. We should have time. So Ms. Michael's joining us in Glenview, Illinois. Come on in and uh, ask away. Sorry, we're having a lot of trouble with our uh, connection. I think I, I see Ben. Ben, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. So I have a question. Wouldn't it be uh, dark most of the year at daytime? Since it's uh, so down south. Yeah. So, so the dark. How do you do your study? Dark. So yeah. you you've frozen, but I think the question was, um, how do you study penguins when it's dark? Well, it's it's only dark a few months of the year, and it, you have to be really far south in Antarctica before it's it's permanently dark, and that's largely when penguins aren't breeding. So if we get dark images from the cameras for a couple of months a year, it doesn't matter. It doesn't um, actually doesn't affect our data because, for example, uh, Adelis might come back in October when it's fairly light and disappear around February, March when it's starting to get dark. So we can see them all throughout the summer months. So, of course, it's the opposite to us. So... We in the Northern Hemisphere um, are coming into autumn now. So in Antarctica, it's getting towards springtime. Yeah, great question, guys. I'm glad we finally got the one about darkness. Uh, whenever we do Arctic or Antarctic, we get that. So that's awesome. Thanks to the student in the first class. Ms. Falcher's group, thank you for your patience. Let's bring you guys back into the thing and uh, ask away. Uh, what can you tell us about the penguins of the Galapagos Islands? Yeah. Sorry, uh, that cut out for me. That's okay. The penguins in the Galapagos Islands, what can you tell us about them? It's one that a lot of people might not know about. Oh, uh, not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not a lot because I work in Antarctica. Um, but uh, what I would say about penguins in general is that they people think of them as cold adapted birds, and that's true in the water. It's not true on land. So there are about as many... Um, uh, as about as many species of penguin that are adapted to temperate or warm temperatures as there are cold. Uh, and they probably evolved out of either Chile or um, or New Zealand, uh, which is, you know, warmer than Antarctica. But the in the water, they're very definitely cold adapted. So um, uh, the Galapagos has the, not the Benguela current, um, the Humboldt current. And um, so, yeah, they're, although they're in a warm area on the equator, they're in actually quite cold water. And um, they're also the really good predators. So the, the black and white, if you think of a penguin like that, they're actually evolved to be like that. So that's where the color scheme comes from. So they're dark on top and light on the underside. And that means if you're a predator or a prey looking at them from above, um, you'll see them in dark water, dark against a dark background. Yeah. And they actually use that to, to feed on their prey. So penguins have a lot of fat. They're relatively buoyant. So they dive under the things they want to eat. They look up 
And they use that buoyancy to kind of ambush fish and krill. Um, and that is the same wherever you are. So um, the, the bigger species, the more south you go, the bigger the species get on average. As you go further north, um, the blue penguin in Australia and New Zealand and the Galapagos, they get quite a lot smaller as they get into slightly warmer waters and, and ambient temperatures. Yeah. I love that we got counter shading into the broadcast. If you guys are keen on that, uh, that's your science word of the day, counter shading. We've covered that with OceanWise in the past as well. And for Ms. Fox, student, I will find some resources on Galapagos penguins for you guys. So you can check for that in your email uh, later. But uh, thanks for the, the question. Let's try and get four more questions if we can. I'm going to go back to Minnesota to our teachers there. If you two have another question for us, just give you your mics and you're, uh, you're good to go. Oh, but you do need to de your mic. It, for whatever reason, won't let me do it. Uh, it wants to work. There we go. Sorry. Um, we were wondering how they withstand the cold. Do they have um, really long hair? Um, or other adaptations? They have a ton of adaptations. So um, they have feathers and they're, they're really cool feathers because they, they actually have two areas. So this is a lot like wearing a down jacket. The outside is waterproof and the inside is fluffy and traps air. So they, they have feathers that, that tile like this and they overlap they're very densely overlapping and that outside the ends of them are waterproof. And there's a really fluffy bit near the base and that produces this kind of, this real double layer. Um, in addition to that, they tend to carry quite a lot of fat for a bird. They don't fly, they have solid bones rather than hollow. Um, and that helps them with diving, but also because they don't have to fly, they can also put on a lot more mass, they can be heavier and a lot more fat. Uh, so that helps actually with the cold adaptation as well as with diving. And, and similarly, because don't forget, a lot of the cold they're adapting for is in the water because it's you lose a lot of heat in cold water. And they have this um, heat exchange system on both their feet and their flippers, which is that blood going out to the extremity has veins circling it. So hot blood going out gets rapidly cooled and transfers its heat to blood coming from the extremities. So they're losing a lot more, a lot less heat uh, than we would by putting our hands in water. Yeah. We should all love something so much in life as you love penguins, Tom. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> the passion is infectious. Okay, we're going to try and get two more questions in if we can. So I'm going to go back to the Glass family. If you guys have another one for us, just deem your mics and uh, come on up. That's good to go. Um, where does the Isbeleen penguin live? Where does the... Sorry, say again. Isabeline penguin. Isabeline? Oh, right, that is a colour um, uh, change. So these are... Um, this could be any species of penguin um, and there's a, a mutation or an expression of a gene that means they don't usually they don't exp express the black bit so you see basically an all-white penguin and and uh, it's rare in gentes I've seen it quite a lot in a dailies um, but yes that that's um it's a mutation that occurs naturally and you see it in you know every few thousand penguins you see one of those Hmm, how cool is that? Um, before we go to Ms. Michael to wrap up, Ms. Thompson's class, Asheville, North Carolina, joining us on YouTube, welcome into them. They want to know, despite all the hardships, is there something that's particularly or the best part about studying penguins, Tom? Oh, God, they are just fascinating to look at. I mean, it's, yeah, um, yeah it's like um, sitting in a cafe and watching a busy street uh, hmm. where you can kind of snoop on people without any guilt. It's um, it's incredible. the The complexities of a colony um, is is really weird and wonderful to watch, and and very loud. Uh, so so yeah, that and that's that you know, that's apart from where you are. I mean, when you look around in Antarctica, it makes your heart sing. It is so beautiful, 
Mm. Um, it's often trying to kill you, but despite that, it's very, very beautiful. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Tom. All right, uh, one last question, Ms. Michaels class. Come on up, guys, and wrap us up. Hey, does that, somebody have a question? Otherwise, I have one from Emma. Okay, Emma wanted to know, how can you tell the males from the females? Uh, you can't really. Um, by looking at them, you can't tell the difference. Um, my, a lot of birds are sexually dimorphic, so the sexes look different, but penguins, not at all. If you see them together, if you see a pair together, there's often one that's just a little bit bigger, and that's usually a male. Uh, there's often a very tiny difference in the bill, but frankly, you, you couldn't bet on it. So what we do is we collect feathers from the nest and we can do it genetically. We can work out uh, by DNA which sex is which. With the cameras, if you look at a time lapse of the cameras, particularly if it's every minute, you know that the female lays the egg and then after a while, um, after a couple of days, the male switches over and, and incubates it and vice versa. So if you're following them over time, you can work out which is which, but otherwise it's, it's impossible to tell. And there's no morphology that's different externally. It's all internal. They keep the cold bits warm. Fantastic. Tom, before we wrap up, uh, this has been such a, such a fun session. I'm going to get everyone to say a big bye and wave. So if all our groups want to do their mics uh, before I bring them into the broadcast in a minute, please do so. Just a quick plug for our Backyard Bio Initiative so all September long. I know a bunch of you teachers are already involved, which is great. Uh, but we are encouraging kids to get out, explore wildlife, find the amazing creatures near them. Not all of us can get to Antarctica like Tom. is a very lucky guy, and I'm sure he'd be the first to say that. Uh, but wherever you're at, you are you can all go to Penguin Watch. Take it back. You can all go to Penguin Watch. <laughs> PenguinWatch.org, and That's you can true. <laughs> and we're going to send all our students there. So for all the groups that registered, we will send more information on Penguin Watch, how you can get involved, a real citizen science project. It's amazing. Check out Backyard Bio. Check out Penguin Watch. I'll bring that up for a second as well. And uh, let's bring everyone into the broadcast, Ms. Olson, Ms. Foster, the Glass family, and Ms. Michael's group. You guys want to join me in saying thank you. 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 Th